Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. Today, uh, we are going to talk about uh, President Barack Obama of the United States, as well as uh, U.S. policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world, as well as uh, U.S. domestic policies. Obama has tried to uh, present himself as being different from his predecessor, uh, George W. Bush, in terms of uh, Obama claiming to follow a softer policy. We want to see whether that is a reality or is it simply rhetoric uh, that he has uh, indulged in in order to lull uh, people both in the United States as well as around the world that Obama is any different from his uh, predecessor. In order to help us, uh, we have uh, Brother Afif Khan, who is a fellow at the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought. He's also on the editorial, editorial board of uh, Crescent International, as well as uh, the editor of the monumental tafsir, the Ascendant Quran, that is being written by Imam Muhammad al-Asi. Brother Afif, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, let me uh, get your take on uh, this speech that um, uh, Barack Obama delivered on May 23rd uh, at the U.S. Defense College, uh, in which he said uh, that uh, the U.S. needs to wind down its war on terror, that the U.S. will not be able to uh, kill every terrorist in the world, and that there are different ways to approach this problem. Do you believe Obama? Uh, this president is uh, very good at saying something and doing something else. Uh, he says that they're winding down the uh, war on terror, uh, but that should uh, translate into reducing the number of American military bases across the world. Uh, it was said that uh, uh, the new uh, U.S. military engagement in the world is going to be uh, special forces and uh, they're going to have uh, quick response units all across the world. Uh, we didn't see any indication in his speech that there's going to be a reduction in the funding for special forces operations uh, and uh, for any of these uh, 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 bases from where drones are launched in the world. Uh, it's just uh, uh, when he's talking about uh, 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 winding down the war on terror, uh, what he's really talking about is uh, the, the changing face of U.S. engagements across the world. They're not going to have any boots on the ground. Uh, they're basically going to have mechanical soldiers in the form of drones uh, and uh, in the form of uh, satellite and uh, other reconnaissance type of activity, which is going to isolate uh, a particular battlefield. Uh, if we take a look at uh, uh, at uh, uh, the U.S. war efforts, uh, especially in the Islamic East, uh, right now they're, uh, uh, they're uh, equipping uh, as much as they can uh, the opposi opposition forces against the Syrian government. Uh, they're building up uh, the rhetoric uh, to launch a war against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, uh, they already uh, split uh, the country of Sudan into two pieces. Uh, they're continuing their war effort in Somalia. Uh, they're continuing their war effort in Yemen. Uh, 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 just recently, a couple of days uh, ago, there was a, a drone strike in Pakistan. That, that doesn't seem to be any abatement uh, of those activities uh, in that part of the world. And so uh, I believe that uh, what this president is saying is that he's trying uh, to uh, tell a war-weary public in the United States that uh, uh, we're now going to concentrate on domestic issues. Uh, but uh, in the United States, all you have to do is follow the money trail. And if you take a look at the latest budget uh, of the United States, uh, uh, defense spending, although reduced a little bit uh, in magnitude, is probably higher than last year's budget. And so uh, 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 his words have to be tested by action. Now, you say that um, the U.S., um external policy uh, has not changed in terms of uh, its uh, so-called war on terror, that perhaps um, there may be uh, fewer 
boots on the ground, that means there may be fewer soldiers operating overseas, but the mechanical war uh, through drones and other kinds of operations is continuing. And in fact, in some instances, it has even escalated. What about the domestic situation? Has that changed in any way since 9-11 uh, when uh, the U.S. launched its uh, campaign of intimidation, harassment, and uh, arrests of uh, Muslims, law-abiding citizen Muslim citizens in the U.S.? Has that changed in any way? Uh, it's oppression of Muslims and the oppression of the U.S. public at large. Uh, uh, the Muslims are the most convenient scapegoat. Uh, but in this administration especially, it started in the Bush administration and, uh, and Obama has not only continued Bush's policies, but he's expanded upon them. And so there has been a blurring between uh, the, the civilian constabulary forces in the United States, which are the police departments, and the military. And so now you have uh, military personnel training uh, police departments across the country. And uh, insofar as the New York Police Department is concerned, uh, it has special units which are being trained by the CIA. The CIA is not supposed to be doing any domestic spying operations. Uh, they're not supposed to be conducting any domestic uh, intelligence activity. And so to get around that, uh, uh, police departments like uh, the New York Police Department uh, uh, not only established an office in the state of Israel, but uh, they're employing CIA techniques to keep an eye on New Yorkers. And so uh, whatever was learned uh, uh, by the United States in its foreign engagements and in its foreign intelligence gathering activity to uh, subvert people's movements across the world, they're applying that to people's movements in the United States. Uh, 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 the freedom of assembly in the United States, not just, not just of Muslims, uh, but uh, anti-establishment forces in the United States, constitutional forces in the United States who are trying to hold meetings across the country uh, they're being monitored by the FBI. And uh, so, so what does this say about freedom of assembly in the United States? Uh, that's supposed to be guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, the FBI and the CIA, they're not supposed to be uh, spying on their own people. Uh, and so uh, uh, insofar as the war on terror is concerned overseas, the, uh, everything that was learned is now being applied to the people of the United States. And it's just that the Muslims uh, uh, happen to be uh, currently a convenient scapegoat but there are plenty of dissatisfied people in the United States. They see that uh, their government uh, is running amok away, away from the Constitution. And, uh, and these forces, they're trying, uh, 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 with whatever wherewithal they have, uh, to try uh, their best to bring uh, uh, the government in line with, the, uh, with, uh, with constitutional principles. But well, as far as the administration is concerned, uh, uh, it has no desire to... Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, permit civil liberties in the way that the people were used to them in the past 30 years. But don't the Americans realize that their rights are being taken away step by step? Uh, some Americans are concerned. Uh, and, uh, and this is on both sides of the aisle, uh, progress progressives as, as well as conservatives. They see their civil liberties slipping away. Uh, they have no confidence in government. Uh, that's why uh, uh, over the past uh, several elections, uh, there's been a vibrant third party movement uh, because uh, whatever needs the people have and whatever uh, uh, communal objectives they want to achieve, they feel that they cannot achieve those objectives through uh, the Republican mandate or the Democratic mandate. And uh, uh, so a lot of people are uh, either becoming independent uh, they've lost confidence in the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, as far as uh, the rank-and-file American is concerned, uh, one really has to feel sorry for them because the standard of living has fallen tremendously. Um, uh, the wages have not kept up with the, uh, uh, how inflation is raising prices. And so a typical American uh, uh, who earns uh, somewhere between thirty-five and forty-two thousand dollars a year, is having a very difficult time keeping up with expenses, and so they almost have no time to pay attention uh, to uh, to what their public representatives are doing. Uh, they're so much involved in just trying to make ends meet, and then besides that, uh, uh, insofar as the media in the United States is concerned, uh, it is not 
observing its fundamental responsibility of uh, observing and holding accountable the officials of government. That's supposed to be the mandate for the media. And because it's not fulfilling that role, uh, in fact, uh, it's basically acting as an arm of, uh, of the government. Uh, it's rubber stamping its policies, rationalizing its, uh, 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 its approaches, and, uh, and then uh, it feeds uh, all of this material to the American people uh, in a way that uh, suggests that uh, the government is serving the people, that in fact it's the media which is serving the government and the government is serving corporate interests. Mm -hmm. Why is the U.S. government uh, clamping down on its own citizens? Uh, what is it that the U.S. government and establish fear from its own people? Uh, because the, the, the United States government uh, uh, primarily is not serving the needs of the people. Uh, you know, the, the, the people have needs uh, for security. The people have needs uh, for social services. Uh, uh, they have a variety of needs that the government is supposed to be providing, and the government is not providing those services. And so any government uh, which is on its way to becoming an oppressive government, uh, its biggest fear is that the people will come together and uh, form a united front uh, against uh, those uh, who usurp power for, uh, for special interests. And so I feel uh, that the government recognizes this. Uh, and uh, uh, they tried as, as hard as they can to limit the power of the people by dividing them. And, uh, and so this is, what's, this is exactly what's going on in the United States. Uh, it's trying to separate one religious community from another. It's trying to separate uh, ethnic communities from one another. Uh, and uh, it's, it has its people living in a state of fear. Uh, you don't know if your neighbor is working for the FBI. Uh, you're afraid to talk to your neighbor. You're afraid to go to church, uh, or you're afraid, uh, as far as Muslims are concerned, they're afraid to go to their masjids because they don't know who's spying on them. And so everybody is living in a state of fear. Uh, and that used to be a characteristic of the third world. It didn't used to be a characteristic of, uh, of the so-called first world. Uh, but if you go into the United States, there is a, there's a palpable uh, feeling of fear amongst the people. And it's not just related to taxes. It's, a, it's actually related... Uh, to people who, f who fear that uh, if uh, they do something which is not approved by the government, that they could just disappear. Uh, that uh, uh, the, the executive branch of the government doesn't have to provide any proof, any justification for holding people without detention and uh, for throwing them in prison and, uh, and they just sort of enter into a black hole. And, and people don't want that to happen to them and so uh, 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 so this, uh, this, this feeling of fear has created the kind of inertia uh, which uh, allows the government to get away with all kinds of abuses of power. Did the Occupy Wall Street movement have anything to do with uh, spurring the U.S. establishment to take these drastic steps against its people? I mean, for instance, uh, is the government... Uh, afraid of its own people? Uh, I think that the Occupy Wall Street movement had something to do with it, but uh, I really think that uh, uh, what had more to do with it uh, is the awakening that's taking place in the Muslim world. And I think it's the awakening that's taking place in the Muslim world that had uh, a major impact on Occupy Wall Street. Uh, the, uh, the liberation movements which are taking place in the Muslim world uh, the Muslims throwing off the shackles of oppression, uh, I think that sent uh, inspirational vibrations across the world. And uh, it inspired some people uh, who, who saw diminishing civil rights here in the United, uh, in the United States. Uh, it inspired them. And they, said, uh, they thought to themselves that if uh, uh, people in other parts of the world uh, can liberate themselves from massive oppression, then uh, we here in the West, we ought to be able to liberate ourselves from the oppres oppression that we're experiencing, uh, financial oppression, uh, and uh, the oppression that's related uh, to not getting the proper information from, uh, from media channels. But the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, did not last uh, very long. It petered out pretty quickly. Uh, why do you think that happened? Uh, uh, in order to try to understand that, let's go back uh, to uh, the civil rights movement and uh, what Malcolm X uh, said about the same thing. Uh, 
during the civil rights movement, the African Americans were out in the street, and they had basically brought to a halt uh, the functions of the civic organs of government. The uh, you know, the government couldn't function with all of these uh, protesters in the streets all the time. And uh, so, uh, so some of the pundits, uh, Malcolm X was on a radio program one time, and so one of the, the, the hosts, uh, he suggested uh, to Malcolm X and to the other people that were on the panel, other African Americans that were on the panel, that, you know, why don't you take your... Uh, uh, you know, problems through the court system. You know, there, there are mechanisms that are set up uh, uh, for you to uh, air your grievances and, uh, you know, to make changes. And so Malcolm X said that, you know, our power is in the street. We have no power with the system. This is a corrupt system. And the more that we try to use the system uh, to obtain just ends, the more we're going to fail. But in the street, we have power. And I think that as far as the Wall Occupy Wall Street movement was concerned, uh, uh, when you decide to go out into the street, uh, you have to have the internal fortitude to stay there uh, through the thick and the thin, uh, much as what happened uh, during the Islamic Revolution in Iran. The people had the fortitude to stay in the street day after day, month after month. And I think that as far as the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, is concerned, uh, the same thing, they tried to do the same thing to that movement. They said that you, uh, you list your grievances, you know, what are your top three or four or five or six demands, and let's take it through the court system and, uh, you know, see what we can achieve. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, the police forces came down very hard on the uh, Occupy protesters. And, uh, and uh, they didn't have the kind of staying power that is necessary in order to uh, drive changes into the public space, uh, you know, much like the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, as far as the Civil Rights Movement was concerned, uh, there was something, uh, I guess, unique about it uh, in that uh, many of these people were very, very poor, and they had nothing to lose. Uh, as far as Occupy Wall Street protesters are concerned, you know, they came from, uh, uh, from middle class and upper middle class backgrounds. And the more they stayed out in the street, the more they had to lose. And uh, so, uh, you know, their attachment, you know, to the material aspect of uh, uh, the United States uh, or the American culture was a lot heavier than uh, the material attachment of the protesters in the civil rights movement. As I'm saying, they had nothing to lose. And so they could afford to stay out in the street day after day and month after month which forced the, uh, uh, the government officials, or the elected representatives, to make changes. And uh, in, in the case of Occupy Wall Street, uh, that wasn't the case. I want to touch on another aspect, and that is uh, this um, Boston uh, Marathon bombing that occurred in uh, mid-April. Uh, various theories have been floated, and a lot of news leaks essentially coming from uh, anonymous government sources have tried to project that these two Chechen brothers uh, were responsible for it. Uh, do you believe that they were really responsible for uh, the bombings that occurred in Boston? Uh, first of all, I guess we have to say that a lot more information is going to come out about uh, this bombing. And it's going to continue to trickle out over the next couple of years. And uh, it's only probably after a couple of years that uh, people will begin to put the entire picture together. Um, we know uh, from the information that has come out, and by the way, most of the information that's coming out is coming uh, either through U.S. intelligence uh, or through Russian intelligence. Uh, there's been, so far that I know, there's been no independent investigation uh, of uh, the build-up to the Boston Marathon bombing, what led to it, and, uh, and what happened in its aftermath. Um, uh, as far as these two brothers uh, that were blamed, uh, the way that the older brother was killed, uh, there's still uh, a lot is not known about it. Uh, at first it was said that uh, he shot back at the police officers and later they said that uh, 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 the forensic evidence of the bullet holes in his body uh, and, uh, and uh, other large wounds on his body was not consistent with the fact that, that he was the one who was shooting. 
And uh, there was also a U.S. police officer which was killed, uh, who was killed in that incident. And again, it's not known whether he, that police officer was killed by friendly fire or uh, was this uh, an ethical police officer who saw that uh, the FBI and uh, the other U.S. intelligence forces were really doing something wrong or they were covering up evidence. It's not known. And so uh, as far as the facts of this particular case are concerned, uh, the family of the two brothers, they're adamant that these two boys were set up. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, the two boys' uncle, uh, who happens to live in Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, as soon as uh, uh, news of the incident was aired in the media, uh, he came out in the media and he said that uh, he condemned his own nephews, uh, uh, even though all the facts of the case were not out yet. And uh, later on it emerged that uh, this uncle was married to uh, the daughter of Graham Fuller. And Graham Fuller is a very high level, used to be a very high level operative in the CIA. And so it's obvious that, uh, that these two brothers, uh, they had FBI handlers and they had contact with the CIA and they had contact with Russian intelligence. Uh, uh, my personal feeling is that insofar as this uh, Boston Marathon bombing is concerned, uh, it has a lot to do with the situation in Syria. Uh, my feeling is that the United States is trying somehow to sideline uh, the Soviet veto uh, of UN resolutions that are preventing uh, uh, NATO from establishing a, a no-fly zone uh, inside of Syria. And uh, so uh, uh, this uh, so-called Russian connection uh, with regard to this bombing, uh, my feeling is that it's intended to uh, to disarm the uh, the Russians from uh, from continuing to apply their veto in the uh, in the United Nations Security Council. Now there is another uh, aspect to uh, the Boston bombing. Um, soon after that, uh, the city was uh, put under complete lockdown. The entire city, and there are ten thousand police and security personnel that uh, went from door, door to door. They beat up people in their homes uh, and um, all kinds of other. Uh, terrible activities occurred, uh, all ostensibly to capture one teenager who also incidentally, according to their uh, sources, had already been uh, badly injured. Uh, why do you think the U.S. government needed to resort to such extreme violent uh, methods? Now, I, I think it's to create an environment of fear in the United States that your security is at stake and that in order to maintain security, civil liberties have to be withdrawn. And uh, the more that these incidents take place and the closer they are to each other, uh, the more the state can withdraw the limited amount of civil liberties that the people have and thereby it'll be easier to control them. Uh, at the same time, uh, they are able to achieve a whole suite of foreign policy objectives uh, by, uh, uh, by identifying the attackers as Muslims. Uh, and uh, what's, uh, again, what's uh, a little unsettling about this particular case uh, is that these two Muslims, uh, they apparently had no links uh, with so-called foreign terror groups. Uh, they came over uh, to the United States when they were much younger. Uh, their family was, uh, uh, it came to the United States when the boys were much younger. And uh, the boy who survived, uh, uh, who wasn't killed by the U.S. intelligence forces, uh, it said that, you know, he used to go to bars and he used to smoke pot and, uh, you know, just basically like an American kid, uh, which you would consider to be, you know, a normal, a so-called normal American kid. And uh, I think the message that the U.S. government is trying to drive home is that even these so-called normal Muslims, uh, Muslim American kids, you know, who are exhibiting uh, normal American behaviors, uh, even they uh, uh, can be affected uh, by this religion of violence uh, to, uh, uh, to go out and kill innocent people. And so uh, I, I think that as far as the U.S. government is concerned and uh, their media propaganda organs, uh, they've been trying to, to paint Islam as a culprit. Uh, uh, and that it is Islam that drives 
these young Muslims to do these kinds of acts. And so, uh, so this is just another one of those incidents that allows them to continue this propaganda campaign against Muslims, this Islamophobia campaign, to, uh, uh, to achieve certain foreign policy objectives. Now, what was the reaction of the various uh, Muslim organizations and Muslim leaders to this horrendous assault on the legitimate rights of uh, the Muslim citizens of the United States? I think the Islamic organizations, uh, through their work uh, with PR groups, uh, you know, on K Street in Washington and in, on Madison Avenue in New York, uh, they're now prepared for these kinds of incidents. And so as soon as an incident like this happens, they come out with uh, a perfunctory set of remarks uh, about how they condemn violence and how about Islam is not a religion of violence. And, um, and uh, they accept uh, the idea that uh, these events are disconnected from larger geopolitical objectives. You know, that, uh, you know, that just something just happens out of the blue. And uh, uh, it's wrong, I think, for Islamic organizations uh, uh, to take a look at events in a such a parochial fashion, uh, to issue these statements and uh, to issue apologies when no facts are in whatsoever. And when it's impossible to ascertain what the real facts of the case are, uh, they, they would be more, they would be better advised uh, to make the kind of statements that suggest that you know we will be ready to comment on these uh, events and other events once all of the facts are in, and uh, and once it's discovered, uh, uh, you know what happened in this case, and so then we'll go ahead and uh, uh, make a set of comments, but in the meantime. Uh, uh, what we are really concerned about, and this is where they ought to be directing the public's attention to, what we are really concerned about is uh, uh, the government spending public funds to, uh, 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 to hire people uh, uh, to spy on us. That's what we are really concerned about. And that ought to be the primary issue uh, insofar as the Islamic organizations are concerned. And uh, uh, they ought to be using whatever face time they have in public uh, 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 to drive this point home, that it, it's wrong for the government uh, to, uh, uh, to be spying on, uh, on Muslim organizations and uh, to be joining Muslim congregations uh, to, uh, uh, to either scare them or to entrap them. So why haven't these organizations done that? You always end up sacrificing your personal, your principle, the Islamic principles for personal gain. And uh, it appears that uh, the Islamic organizations have fallen into this, uh, into this trap. Um, uh, many of them are headquartered in Washington. Um, just like other special interest groups, they have uh, their lobbying arms in Washington. And, uh, uh, you know, they have a chance to go to White House dinners uh, but the price of going to those dinners is that you can't make any waves in the public space. You have to follow the rules. And, uh, and th the minute that you begin to talk about social justice issues, about civil rights issues, and the violation of uh, the civil rights of American citizens who happen to be Muslims, uh, you don't get you know, uh, an opportunity to have your photograph taken with the president or to be invited to a White House dinner. Uh, or, uh, you know, to be given uh, any of the other facilitations that come uh, with uh, uh, following and approving line with the government. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have, Brother Afif. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, we hope to see you on another episode of Muslim Perspectives. Thank you. Barakallah. Well, to our viewers, uh, that's all the time we have for today. You've been watching Muslim Perspectives. We look forward to seeing you again on another episode at the same time, same channel. Until then, I'm Zafar Bangash. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.